Hey, brother. Hear me now. Brother, dog. Know me. Understand. Welcome to the Sargassum Podcast. My name is Robbie Thigpen. I'm Francisca Elmer. And I am Mar Fernandez. And we are your hosts for today. We're going to share with you the latest ideas and solutions about sargassum, which has become an international challenge. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Sargassum podcast. Today, I got some good news from the Sargassum Bulletin, which is um, a bulletin that comes out every three months from CERMES um, at UVI. And they just came out with the November bulletin, which looks at how much sargassum we're going to have until March. And as usual, during this time of the year, there will be not much sargassum landing on the beaches of the Southern Caribbean. So that's really good news. Um, but today, we're actually going across the Atlantic to, um, virtually of course, to talk to Dr. John Millich. Dr. John Millich is part of the Algal Biotechnology Research Group at the University of Greenwich. He has been researching methods to turn sargassum into products since he joined the team over seven years ago. Currently, he is working on a Darwin Plus project to find sustainable solutions for sargassum inundations in the Turks and Caicos Islands. He is also part of the Interreg project called Valgerize that looks towards the valorization of seaweed and microalgae as food on the European market. Um, thank you, John, for making time to talk to us today and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Welcome, John. I would like to start with the first question that we asked to all our guests of this podcast, and that is, what is sargassum for you? What does it mean for you? Well, I see it's a broad genus or family of brown seaweeds, and it probably has more than 300 species, the vast majority of which have a phase of their life cycle that's anchored to the seafloor. Holopelagic, which is a fancy word for floating, really, sargassum, it's two species species sargassums natans and fluitans spends all its life floating and never attaches to the sea floor this is pretty unique uh, in the open oceans it's tremendous ecological and climate resource however over the last 10 years there's been enormous beach inundations on the caribbean gulf of mexico and west africa and this is causing significant economic challenges And our research really is whether we can turn this golden tide into a golden opportunity. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent. I've kind of got two questions for you. And uh, one is, you know, you mentioned fluotons and nautons, and, uh, and that's where you work. Uh, you know, it didn't start with this stuff. It started with uh, multicum and all. And we'd like for you to, Yeah, you know, after it invaded the uh, waters of the UK, we'd like to tell you a little bit about you to tell us a little bit about that. But first, can you tell us a little bit about your background image? My background? Yeah, no, your background image. My background image. Oh, well, that's a, a picture uh, from the turn of the century, the last century. I keep missing a century, but the turn of the last century called Gathering Seaweed by Harold Harvey. Now, I don't know exactly where it was, uh, but uh, it was auctioned a few years ago by David Messam's Fine Art Museum. So I think it's quite a famous painting. Uh, and they gave me position, uh, permission to use it um, because it's past copyright. So it was their photograph that they've given me permission to use and it's quite a nice talking point really isn't it oh it's and, lovely it's lovely yeah. and it shows it shows how 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 we have utilized seaweed and as we briefly discussed how uh, uh, people in the past really knew how to use uh, the ecological resources of our planet perhaps better than we do excellent well can you tell us about your original work with uh, multicums and uh, when it invaded the uk 
Yeah, no, I, I, when I joined the University of Greenwich from the University of Southampton, I grew up a bit because uh, in my previous re research with the University of Southampton and as head of research at Pure Energy Fuels, I worked with microalgae, uh, plankton. I've now grown up and I work with the big stuff, seaweed or macroalgae. Uh, so our initial interest was on Sargassum muticum. Now that's an invasive species to the UK and Europe. It arrived in around about the early 1970s so we were all uh, fashion challenged at the time with flares and high waste but uh, that's a different story but uh, yeah it was found about that time we think it might have arrived earlier and it has established itself very much here now it's a uh, uh, a very invasive species it's spread tremendously it grows 10 times faster than some of our native species like such as ascophyllum nidosum and invasive species are a tremendous problem worldwide they probably account for 1.4 trillion us dollars that's about five percent of the world's economy uh, so we started to look at the potential for this material uh, because it's quite expensive to try and uh, and collect to reduce its impact. We can't eradicate it, but we can try and reduce its impact. It had no industrial exploitation at the time. And I was uh, uh, working on a project called Macro Bio Crude, which was looking at uh, converting seaweed into liquid fuels at the time. And that prompted the study of Sargassum muticum. And not only have we looked at its potential as a fuel, we've also invested its potential as a pharmaceutical and dental product uh, with some work funded by some partner companies and the, the higher value chemicals from plants network. Okay, so after all these years of studies, can you give us an estimate of how suited is actually sargassum for fuel? Is it good, medium, bad? Um... Well, theoretically, its potential is quite good. Um, and the problem is that that theoretical potential in terms of biogas yield doesn't transfer into practical yield. That? And that's one of the things we've been looking for there. In fact, probably the holy grail that we're looking for is to try and find the inhibitory compounds, the bacterial inhibitory compounds within the sargassum. Uh, and if we can remove them, then we may have a product product that's benefit to, to humankind uh, in terms of being an antibacterial, but then also increasing the fuel uh, that we can gain from the residual biomass. So we were looking for a win-win situation. We haven't got there yet, but we continue to search and strive. And, it, and Sargassum, uh, we're now looking broader than just the one species, Muticum, obviously. Mm -hmm. So there's... Um something in the sargassum that makes the yield for the fuel less um, less big, you say. Um, and that stuff you could actually maybe use as a medicine. That, 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 that is it. Yeah, we, we, we've, as I say, we've looked for, uh, particularly for uh, inhibitors, uh, uh, bacteria and anaerobic bacteria can be pretty nasty as an infective agent and so we've looked particularly as dental products and looking at uh, replacements for chlorhexidine uh, but we haven't found in our mixtures yet anything that's anywhere near as effective as chlorhexidine what uh, my uh, phd student patch has been working on is identifying some of those products particularly phenolics um, and then hopefully we might be able to pick a winner, but we haven't got anywhere near that. There's a huge range of phenolics. So, and uh, she is uh, incredibly industrious and has produced quite a bit now, but she's ending uh, a PhD very shortly. So we look forward to getting more publications and wide dissemination of her work. Nice. And, um as the UK, because the Gulf Stream, have y'all been getting a lot any landings from uh, our pelagic sargassum from down here because of the well, Gulf Stream or anything like that? I'm no oceanographer, but uh, as far as I'm aware, sargassum's 
kept to the west of Europe by the, the Canary Current. Um, I believe there may have been some rare sightings of the, of the pelagic sargassum. However, I did start having a look. I Googled it at last yesterday evening quite extensively and nothing came up. And I'm sure I had some references, but um, I had a search and nothing came to mind. Now, probably this interview might prompt somebody to give a definitive answer. I'm sure I've read it, but I couldn't find it. So it doesn't exist. But the thing is, we get lots of press reports of the odd Caribbean animal species appearing off our coast. It makes great news. And sunfish, for example, are increasingly common off our coasts in the summer. However, a small clump of seaweed probably will get uh, missed and probably wouldn't generate the excitement of uh, an exotic turtle or fish. That's very true. Very true. I think in 2009 or 11, I don't remember correctly, there was one event where some sargassum uh, flutans and natans arrived in the coast of northern Spain. And so probably also something arrived in England, but maybe not too much. No, as I say, it, 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 it's not going to have the impact of a, a beaching of a whale or a, or spotting of a sunfish or, or, or an exotic turtle. And it, the, the whole of the Thames uh, became of interest and shipping was reduced. Uh, and a, a, and a, a fireworks celebration, we hold fireworks for what we call Guy Fawkes Night or Bonfire Night on the 5th of November. And it was canned because it was going to be set off in a barge and off of, uh, off of the promenade in Gravesend because there was a, an exotic marine mammal swimming around and so they didn't want to scare it. So, the, so th there are different sort of trophic levels, if you will, the same in terms of food, in terms of in public interest, that uh, oh, no. the public interest in seaweed is not the same as the public interest in exotic fish or even exotic sea mammals. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I feel I'm yeah, myself a phytoplankton expert, and no one cares about diatoms and <laughs> all these little micro -items. Now, having said that, the Victorians were very interested in, in diatoms uh, and uh, produced amazing microscopic art from them. They're tremendously beautiful natural phenomena. Yeah, and we're trying to change this public interest and by making a sargassum podcast and making everybody very excited, of, at least about sargassum. Uh, we've held some public engagement, uh, and the, one of the ones which is quite well known now across Europe, and I think it, perhaps uh, even in the States, is a thing called Pint of Science, where scientists like me try and make what could be boring subjects um, accessible to the public in a pub over a pint of beer so we talked for 20 minutes or, or so and there was a tremendous positive reaction to uh, to 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 our use of seaweed and algae they were particularly interested in a beer called kelpie beer which is produced in Scotland uh, using uh, uh, brown seaweed. So, uh, yeah, and, and people weren't disgusted by it. They were actually quite infused by what we might do. Yeah, I guess when, when people get to know all the multiple uses that sargassum, for example, could have, they get excited about that. So what other suitable products uh, could be made out of sargassum? Well, there's a, a tremendous range of products have, have been suggested. And in fact, a house has been built from sargassum bricks. It wasn't the most stylish thing, but it, it would probably keep you uh, safe and dry. And I, there was a conference recently um, and there was a company there that's producing a liquid garden fertilizer in the Caribbean using the patented process. Uh, and that's certainly available throughout the Caribbean in the United States and I think it's coming to, to Europe soon. Um, the, the high ash content that is a negative for fuel production could be a positive uh, in terms of providing minerals for plants and in feed for animals. So not everything has a negative aspect. There's always two sides are exposed to a coin. Mm -hmm. Are there any um, uh, issues with uh, concentrations of heavy metals in the sargassum? 
and how well, that one might of the things with, some of these with, with all with all our gears that they do tend to concentrate heavy metals and in fact they've been used for wastewater cleanup um there's some literature dating back to just post-war to um, looking at uh, cleaning up uranium using algae and seaweeds. Um, and there has been considerable concern around the world with a variety of species of sargassum concentrating arsenic. Now, both ourselves and a research group in um, Mexico have just published some information on the levels of arsenic within sargassum, and we all found that they were above a wide number of regulatory limits. Now, the problem with sargassum is that the inorganic form is uh, very much more toxic, uh, toxic than the uh, organic form so what we don't know what we haven't studied is the speciation what type of uh, of, of arsenic is there now in some sargassum not particularly in natans and fluitans we haven't studied it 80 percent of the arsenic can be in this inorganic very toxic form uh, so we really need to study the speciation of the arsenic and the levels of arsenic over a longer time and a wider distribution of the pelagic or this fl floating sargassum. Um, so we haven't done the work yet, but it we do need to take caution, particularly if we're going to use it for fertilizer or feed. Talking to the industrial manufacturer of fertilizer, they say there's very low levels of arsenic in their final product. But where the arsenic then finishes up when they produced it was a question that wasn't fully answered. So uh, that's the problem is that if it's in there at the start, where does it finish up if it doesn't finish up in your final product? So we have to take extreme care. I think there's examples in Switzerland where they'd used waste products as fertilizers in the past and then having to strip whole areas of farms back uh, to remove those toxins that have accumulated over time so we can move forward very rapidly but we can regret it very slowly yeah that's true um i just read an article from the swiss um environmental um department they have a little um magazine coming out and it's mostly lead from people doing wood fired stoves and they put the, the ash from that in the garden. And now a lot of gardens have a high lead content, which is really bad for um, certain vegetables you eat. And also if your kids are playing in there. And as you said, it, it takes a lot of money. You pretty much have to take away the soil and put new soil in there. You mentioned ash, and that's interesting because that's one of the challenges of seaweed is that it can be 30% inorganic on a dry weight basis. So if you think, if those of you, people who've experienced wood burners and you obviously have in Switzerland, is the amount of ash that you get from burning a log, for example. Seaweed is 15 to 20 times higher in ash than the, the typical timber that you would burn in your wood stove so that ash for a fuel is a particular problem because we can't uh, produce energy from it and uh, it is a byproduct which could have value as a fertilizer for example very interesting um so we literally don't know enough about that arsenic problem yet to really make good recommendations and you probably need more samples to, to do this, right? We've got more samples on the way. One of our bits of work that we did early on was uh, to establish whether freeze drying affected what we do. And we found that freeze drying didn't. We'd already proved that with our other species of sargassum. But we wanted to have a look at the fresh stuff. And obviously, we need to get uh, uh, boots on the ground, as it was, or, or flip flops on the sand. Uh, to harvest sargassum so we did that uh, we brought back fresh samples uh, 
with all the appropriate certification, which is difficult to get uh, back here. And then we compared it to freeze dried samples. We have a close association with my, my good friend and colleague, Professor Debbie Bartlett, with the School for Fields on Turks and Caicos. Uh, we've now it's now been funded a freeze dryer on the school for fields and they're now sending us regular samples of sargassum so we can not only monitor the levels of arsenic but we can look at the other key components that we're interested in such as halogenated compounds and phenolics um over the season and with differences in species so we begin to build up a pattern of what we can do with with the sargassum and what's in the sargassum um is sargassum consumed as uh, food in any country at the moment different species are i don't know whether sargassum natans and fluitans are i know you're speaking to debbie bartlett um in a couple of weeks time and, and she would know more about the the uses of of sargassum um i think it's 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 fairly innocuous, although there are reports that the exudate from sargassum can be a skin irritant. And certainly when it breaks down because of the high sulfur content in, in seaweed relative to land plants, then you get to this uh, hydrogen sulfide, which doesn't only smell bad. It's not good for your respiration. OK. Mm. I tried it before. It's a little bit, little bit like salty arugula, but then once I heard about the potential of heavy metals, I stopped um, having small pieces of sargassum. Yeah, but what are the me, other? Me and my students, we would, it would be kind of a dare as being part of the sargassum team to at least eat a piece of sargassum at one point. Yeah, one of the, the flavors, and some people are particularly. Uh, sensitive to it i am is iodine and as you noticed i'm sorry it's, it's afternoon in the uk so i'm still drinking tea uh, to give you a stereotype but one of the things that flavors sometimes you can pick up is, is sort of an iodine taste in tea and there's high levels of iodine in seaweed which is tremendously beneficial in that uh, a lot of diets are very limited in iodine um but also excess iodine can have adverse uh, reactions. We've got another MST student who's uh, about nine months into his PhD who's looking at iodine in various seaweeds, including sargassum and pelagic sargassum. And we're looking at the interaction of those iodinated compounds on, on AD and their levels. So that's a, quite an interesting piece of work because brominated compounds they're all part of that halogenated group that's chlorine fluorine uh, bromine iodine Hal uh, brominated compounds are quite interested in that uh well from an environmental perspective which i won't go into but from, from a usage standpoint uh brominated compounds have been found to reduce methane production by ruminants so it, it has quite a good environmental benefit by adding a small amount of selected seaweeds high in particular brominated compounds like bromoform to reduce methane output. Now, methane may not spring to mind as a, a greenhouse gas. Both will always think of, of carbon dioxide, but methane is at least 23 times uh, more of a greenhouse gas than um, carbon dioxide. So cow burps could contribute quite significantly to, to, to global warming. So trying to reduce that level of methane that's emitted by ruminants uh, is, is, is a very valuable goal. It seems odd that we're trying to produce methane but then we're looking to burn it as a as a as a fuel where we just release uh, carbon dioxide and we benefit from the energy of that uh, conversion from methane to carbon dioxide so how, how are you are, are you heating the um plant material up to in, in some kind of way to remove the methane or are you 
or are you doing it in some other method? We, we use a, this process called anaerobic digestion, which is very simple, really. We just exclude the air and then uh, natural microbes break it down. Now, there's a great advantage of anaerobic digestion is that it uses wet material. Now, if you try and use a process to exploit the energy within seaweed that involves dry material, you have this big problem that the energy used to evaporate off the moisture uses nearly as much heat as is within the biomass itself. And one of the things of seaweed is that the calorific value is quite low because it doesn't contain very much lipid. Most of it is quite low uh, levels of uh, in terms of calorie value carbohydrate um, so if you try and dry it and um, we tried to dry it and looked at the energy balance to pr to to produce um, bio gas or syngas is probably the correct furry synthetic gas, uh, biochar and a sort of bio crude, a sort of crude oil using heat. The the first stage we had to dry it and we used more energy than we put than we could get out. Now, as I say, that's not a problem with anaerobic digestion. It uses wet material. And you've got these series of bacteria it it sounds a very simple process we just you just exclude the air you add some bacteria uh, and, and they begin to break down the material for you but it's a consortium of bacteria so you have at least four stages and if you disrupt any stage you disrupt the whole process and so um it's great. Um, the bacteria don't do it for nothing. Obviously, they reproduce and, and, uh, and multiply on the, on the biomass of seaweed that we're feeding them. But in return, we get methane and um, some carbon dioxide, which we can strip out. And we mentioned microalgae. You could strip that out and feed it to microalgae um, to grow more biomass. But uh yeah it, it is a it's a very interesting process it takes a little time my my experiments take at least 28 days because i uh, the methanogens at the end of the process are quite slow growing uh but uh yeah it's it's an interesting process and i think that there's been a there's been a refocus within Europe and the UK on renewable fuels and biogas in particular. One of the great advantages of biogas is we have the infrastructure in place uh, to burn biogas and to transport gas to replace uh, natural gas, fossil fuel gas, which has been produced by the, exactly the process that you spoke about, which was the use of heat and pressure. Uh, to break down algae um, over millennia. The problem that we have is that that uh, biogas that was produced, natural gas that was produced, took millions of years to produce it, and then we're burning it in a few hundred years. And so we've got a mismatch in the level of carbon dioxide. So if we could bring the whole thing back into balance by growing the seaweed or harvesting the seaweed and then releasing the carbon dioxide in the same time frame then we will maintain a carbon balance within the atmosphere yeah. and many of these going, places oh, sorry. go ahead i just the train of thought was there and if you go one step further on that and you say okay not only we want to burn fuels that we create in that moment like growing the algae and burning them but also we would like to use the algae to sequester co2 from the atmosphere to go back to levels that are safe for our planet. I was wondering how long would it take for bacteria in the deep sea, for example, to remineralize the whole, let's say, sargassum that you would sink down to the deep sea to bring it back again? Would it take a long I, time or? I, I'm sure they've got no idea of the time frame, but there is a com there are people who are looking at uh, growing sargassum or, or other seaweed and then sinking it back into the deep ocean to capture uh, carbon dioxide in that or car carbon in that in that manner um, we're always looking at keeping things in balance you know if we can grow it and then use it then we'll always keep things in balance um, the, 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 it is a problem uh, but 
it was very easy to get fossil fuel and to get natural gas. You just sunk a you sunk a pipe in the in the ground in in Louisiana at the at the in the nineteen hundreds and 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 fuel all bubbled up. But it is getting increasingly difficult to 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 uh, to get fossil fuel, and obviously the catastrophic damage that we could cause if we continue to do that. Uh, one of the things I'm particularly interested in, I don't look at the financial impacts of fuel very often. I look at another metric, which is uh, return on energy investment. And so what it basically says is, uh, do we, how much energy do we use for each unit of energy that we yield? And if it's, if it's greater than one, so we get more energy out than we put in, then, then we're on the right track. When they first put a hole in the ground and started extracting fossil fuel, then they expended one unit of energy for 100 units of energy they got out. So the energy return on investment was 100 to 1. For so the Canadian shale oil, uh, it's probably 3, 4, 5 to 1. And uh, the estimates vary for uh, sugar ethanol, somewhere between three and eight to one. Some of the more exotic things, um, and I might be a little bit out of the date, um, sort of cellulosic ethanol are probably down below three. Now, there's some good news in the a project I was involved in uh, briefly a few years ago called um, all gas, which looks at producing microalgae on uh, municipal wastewater and then anaerobically digesting the, the algae to produce biogas has an energy return on investment between three and a half and four. Uh, and so that's sustainable and they're actually producing uh, methane for running a vehicle fleet in southern Spain uh, from this project called Allgas. So it's quite a commercial success. Uh, now, whether we can do the same if we if we get uh, our figures right with um, Sargassum, we wait to see. But there are other companies that are interested in that. I, I was at a meeting of... Europa E, which is an uh, environmental energy agency in uh, the United States. And there was a company there which is looking at co-digestion of sargassum so, with food waste. Uh, and they were finding that there was a synergy. So if you combine the two, sargassum and the food waste, then you get an enhancement of the amount of gas that's produced. Uh, and so they got a 56% enhancement of the methane potential. Now, we've also done some work on co-digestion. We didn't use food waste. We used uh, uh, waste glycerol from the production of biodiesel. And again, we found a significant uplift in the methane output. So if you've got the appropriate waste on the Caribbean island, we might be able to improve the yield. Um, uh, of of the sargassum so that that that's quite exciting they, and they've been doing this at scale whereas i only do things at fairly small scale unfortunately yeah well an added benefit if they were, if they were able to do this the Caribbean islands a lot of these island nations um, get their energy from diesel and there's also the carbon footprint of just transporting that diesel around and so if they're able to get their energy from the sea right where they are, that j just the shipment carbon footprint of moving their energy around would be greatly reduced. And that would be a huge benefit, I would think. Well, yeah, you talk about islands. I, I, I went on a trip to the Hawaiian Islands. And I finished up and people were saying how expensive, uh, as you say, in America, gas was. We say petrol, of course. Um, was on the Hawaiian Islands relative to the mainland states. Well, I wasn't so shocked by the cost of, of fuel in Hawaii because obviously we get such high tax rates on our fuel in, in Europe. But well, then I 
took a trip over to Molokai. And because of the transportation and extra transportation, Molokai was a, get, a, a factor several times higher than on the, on, the, on the mainland. So this transportation of diesel fuel to power things on remote islands is very challenging. I know fuel is very, very expensive to put in to generate electricity within the, the, these remoter islands or isolated islands. So we may work looking at alternative fuels may work make more economic sense in uh, islands, remote uh, remoter islands than in new urban conurbations. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we're about at the end of our time. So unless anybody else has a question. No, we're all good. John, thank you so much for being our guest today. I hope you had fun. We definitely did. And all the best of luck with um, analyzing your new samples um, from the freeze dryer. Yeah, it's exciting time. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And I hope the podcast continues to grow. Um, I'm sorry if I've waffled on, but that, that's the trouble with talking to an academic. We talk for a living and we can keep going. So thank you once again. Yeah, well, well, you did waffle on, but you kept it interesting, so that was okay. And uh, so we we appreciate it, and I, I believe I learned a little something today, and I hope I think everybody else did too. So uh, thank you well, again. I hope to inform, but not lecture. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks. Everybody. All right, we well, have a good day. Thank you. Yeah, you too. That was kind of cool. It was amazing. I have like thousand new ideas in my head right now. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a very interesting talk. And all, and uh, and I, I think his take on some of this stuff was, it, I found it very intriguing, and uh, and maybe I learned a little something, but you know, you never can tell. Yeah, I didn't completely get the stuff of the bacteria on the sargasso making it less productive for biofuel. It, I it? think it's but no, it's um, compounds inside the sargasso that somehow make it so that there's less methane being yielded than what you would think comes out. Like when you look at the composition of what's inside, but then somehow when you do the chemical reaction, there's less coming out than you would theoretically think. Because and this has nothing to do with the bacteria associated to this, I guess. Well, it, it's, it's, it's a natural, I think it sounded like it was naturally occurring within the uh, sargassum itself, some compound that's in there. Um, I believe what he said that that could increase that is when you uh, mix the scar sargassum with other uh, other products, for example, food waste or glycerides from uh, production mm -hmm. of biodiesel and stuff like that. Yeah. That that increase things. And I don't think he I don't think he said it was bacteria which were causing that, but some phenols or um, I I forgot the exact name of it but he uses the bacteria to digest it and to actually make the methane. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, essentially when we talk about anaerobic, it, uh, it, it's kind of like um, when you have a septic tank for your house, everything goes in there, it's, it's uh, oxygen depleted and it's just things digest in that kind of way. And, and it, even our uh, septic systems are, uh, a pond, a, a containment pond for a um, a hog farm or a, a, a poultry facility or something like that. They they give off methane too and all this stuff mm -hmm. and and so it's you know. I, and, and, I got it now. I think what he said is that he needs exactly as you said he needs the bacteria to degrade the sargassum to create the methane, mm -hmm. and sargassum has some antimicrobial compound that prevents the bacteria from growing and doing their job. Yes. Now I got it. Thanks. <laughs> Give me a while. Excellent. Well, well that's, that was a lot of fun today. We, yeah. Anything else? I think I, I learned a lot about history, like history of seaweed use, also history of fossil fuel use, like that in the beginning they could take 100 times more energy out, it, out of it than they put in, and that now that there's a lot less but because we just got used to using it, we haven't changed our ways yet, um, which hopefully we will do soon. But 
That was really interesting to hear. Yeah, I was also surprised to hear that many biofuels that we already have already have very good yields and we should actually be using them. Yeah, we're going to we're going to change your dye. <laughs> not not put a damper on anything, but we got to, you know, we need we need to embrace the future. It is as and, as we just Yeah, and and the thing is, we've always embraced the future forever. Always wanted to make things a little bit better, but I don't know why there's so much fight against embracing the future now and making things better. I think uh, I think maybe we have too many Luddites out there uh, creeping around and all. Yeah. And I think it may be also that the peop the companies or the lobby who's going out, the fossil fuel companies, aren't the ones doing making the new product. But I mean, Ram, there's more and more fuel companies getting into the biofuel business, right? And so the question is, why are they not pushing it more? Why are they not finally making the transition if they, they could do it? Is it maybe because they haven't found yet the good, efficient biofuel? Um, yeah, I think it's just political. Yeah, okay. I, I think it's political yeah, or here in the states it's political and and uh they're on the side with out trillions of dollars to lobby washington yeah, and they still get subsidized for putting the oil on the ground so yeah yeah and like with biofuels there's also the problem of um using space so you maybe like if you want to use only biofuels then you run out of of agricultural space to, to make food. Exactly. And that's why we need to move to the oceans and then make biofuel from algae because then you don't compete with land. Yeah, yeah. well, at the, at the same time, it's just, it's kind of this can be this spiral and all um, because, you know, we also need trees and we just need to do everything more effectively because, you know, the, the trees clean our air. And one of the problem, biggest problem we have isn't just the pollution we're putting into the air, it's the lack of filters because the devastations of our forest. Yeah, but the and oceans also, have the same role as trees on land. Oh, no, no, I agree. That. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just talking about, uh, you know, agricultural land that's limited. The ocean's a lot less limited as you're trying to, as you're uh, suggesting. Exactly. All right, that was really interesting. I think that's the end of our podcast for today. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you guys a lot. Yeah, Thanks thank a lot. you. Have a nice week. Thank you for tuning in today and learning with us from our guest about sargassum. If you enjoyed our podcast, please consider supporting us financially by becoming a Patreon. For as little as $1 per month, you can support us and take part in an exclusive monthly Zoom happy hour for Patreons, where you can network with our podcast guests and other sargassum enthusiasts. This podcast was produced by Marcel van der Kamp and your hosts today were Robbie Tingham, Francisca Elmer and Mar Fernandez. We will be back next week with another exciting guest. Do you want to find out more about what our guests talked about today? Check our show notes for links to the documents and website. The music in this podcast is from the song Demo Prey by Drizzle Road Rama, an artist from Roatan. You can listen to the full song at the end of this episode. If you enjoy his music, then please follow him on Spotify and YouTube, where you can find more of his music. But for now, here is Demo Prey by Drizzle Road Rama. Hey brother, hear me now, brother dog. Now me understand. Now for them no one be see we get nothing. That's why they my free and always front and star. Now for them no one be see we get nothing. That's why they my free. Now for them my free. They my pray, me no gain progress, no for them my pray. They my pray, me no gain success, no for them my pray. Pray, they my pray, they my pray, me.
no gain progress, not for them a free. They my free me to reap success. So me tell them yeah, my business for money, no take that. Only if it come from Ja, I'll accept that. Not for them I put the trust in and give me set back. Yo, select that, we lam pull up that, tell some we get a bad mind, we no fear them. Anytime them cheat and chat, we no hear them. Me dash a few hot so body queer them. Me dash a few hot so tell them where them. Not for them a free. They my free me no gain progress, not for them my free. They my free me to reap success, so me tell them yeah. Yes, me know me have a lot of fake friends, but me never woulda tap me woulda have fake family. Yeah, so me tell them straight, me no trust them, me no trust you and me no trust him. Fake friend lost, lost bad mind lost in a real life star Me no rate that star, me no rate that uh, Me real for me what that Boss a million shot in a real life Real, real, real life Now for them a free Them a free, me no gain progress Now for them a free Them a free, me no great success Now for them a free Them a free, me no gain progress Now for them a free Success, so me tell you, yeah. Life, but they my hate and grudge and creep on mine. They my move like Judas. They my move like Judas. Plus, everybody have a life to live. So, I'm gonna give one rash clock to a try judge me. Let them chit and chat to what them want to say. Cause none of them out there. Nah, feed them. Nah, they my free. They my free. Me no gain progress. Nah, for them my free. They my free. Me no rip success. Now for them a free Them a free me no gain progress Now for them a free Them a free me no rip success